Guten Abend, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. Mit dem heutigen Abend setzen wir aus dem Forschungskolleg Humanwissenschaften unsere Vorlesungs- und Vortragsreihe mit Diskussion über die Zukunft oder die Perspektiven der Sozialdemokratie in Europa fort. Wir haben im Wintersemester Vorträgen und intensiven Diskussionen aus verschiedenen Perspektiven, Analysen und Prognosen diskutiert über den erkennbaren Verlust der Zustimmung von Wählerinnen und Wählern zugunsten einer sozialdemokratischen oder sozialistischen, aber demokratisch-sozialistischen Politik. Und wir haben diese Perspektive erweitert bereits im Wintersemester aus der rein deutschen Analyse und deutschen Parteiengeschichte hin zu einer europäischen, insofern als wir auch Frankreich ähm, und weitere angrenzende Länder Europas in den Blick genommen haben. Heute Abend setzen wir diesen Perspektivwechsel oder die Erweiterung der Perspektive fort, indem wir in europäische Länder rund um Deutschland und Frankreich. Ich freue mich, dass zu diesem Abend Roman Krakowski unser Referent ist, der sogleich von Pierre Monnet vorgestellt wird. Diese Veranstaltungsreihe wird gemeinsam veranstaltet von Professor Hans-Jürgen Kuhle, aus dem Fachbereich 3 der Goethe-Universität hier in Frankfurt. Und Professor Pierre Monnet ist Professor für Geschichte sowohl in Paris als auch Direktor des Institut Franco-Allemand in Frankfurt am Main und enger Kooperationspartner mit dem Forschungskolleg Humanwissenschaften, das ich in dieser Reihe vertreten darf das eine Einrichtung der Goethe-Universität darstellt, aber auf dem Boden der Gemeinde von Bad Homburg, also einer Nachbarstadt von Frankfurt am Main. This evening we will have the introduction from Pierre Monet and uh, I would like to ask Pierre now uh, to take over. Uh, thank you very much. Ja, vielen Dank, äh, lieber äh, Matthias, äh, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, äh, guten Abend, ich äh, grüße Sie äh, und äh, heiße Sie herzlich willkommen äh, zu äh, diesem Abend. Schön, dass Sie dabei sind und dass Sie immer noch die äh, Lust und auch die Geduld haben, eine weitere Online-Veranstaltung zu besuchen. So wollen es äh, die äh, jetzigen Umstände. Äh, und äh, wie Herr Lutzbachmann äh, das schon äh, eingedeutet hat, äh, wir wollten in dieser Fortsetzung äh, der Vertragsreihe eine Erweiterung der Horizonte äh, weit über Frankreich und Deutschland hinaus, äh, Richtung Osteuropa, Richtung Südeuropa, Richtung auch äh, skandinavische Länder, Großbritannien und so weiter. Also es, es verspricht sehr viel. Und äh, wir beginnen mit äh, Osteuropa oder Zentraleuropa, je nachdem, wie man das äh, in der Longue Durée bezeichnen äh, will und äh, kann. Und wir haben die große Freude, heute Abend äh, Roman Krakowski zu begrüßen und äh, bei uns, mit uns zu haben. Äh, Roman Krakowski äh, ist in der Slowakei äh, geboren, ähm, aber das ist nicht äh, der einzige Grund, warum er für diesen Abend äh, prädestiniert ist. Äh, er hat äh, dann äh, mehrere Stationen äh, in äh, Universitäten und Forschungszentren Zentren, äh, Zentraleuropas äh, dann getan und studiert. Zunächst mal in Bratislava, äh, dann auch äh, in Prag. Äh, er hat auch äh, Forschungsaufenthalte und Studienaufenthalte in Warschau, in Budapest und auch in Russland äh, absolviert. Ähm, 
Er äh, lehrt und forscht jetzt an mehreren äh, Orten, äh, gleichzeitig äh, an dem Institut äh, des Sciences Politiques in Paris, aber auch an der Universität von Genf, äh, im Besonderen in dem äh, Global Studies äh, Institute. Äh, auch in Paris-Sorbonne äh, gibt er auch Vorlesungen und äh, Seminare. Und äh, seine Spezialität, und deswegen haben wir ihn eingeladen, äh, ist die Analyse der politischen Landschaft, im Besonderen in Polen, in äh, Tschechien, in der Slowakei und auch in äh, Ungarn, zu äh, diesem Gebiet, zu diesem äh, Forschungsdomäne hatte mehrere grundsätzliche Studien publiziert. Es sei nur ein paar äh, genannt, ähm, zum Teil auf Französisch, zum Teil auf äh, Englisch. Ich nenne äh, auf Französisch Réinventer le monde, l'espace et le temps en Tschechoslowakie communiste, erschienen in Paris 2014. Dann folgt auch auf Französisch l'Europe centrale et orientale, de 1918 à la chute du mur de Berlin, 2017. Dann 2019, la Slowakie et l'Europe, Essai et Article, und äh, sein allerletztes äh, Buch. Äh, und deswegen hatten wir uns äh, letztes Jahr in Frankreich äh, per Zufall zusammen getroffen, weil er dieses Buch in einer Buchmesse äh, vorgestellt hat und äh, ich meinerseits auch äh, mein Buch, äh, eine Biografie von Karl IV., also ein Tscheche, wenn man so will. Ähm, dann äh, kam es äh, zu äh, dieser Idee, ihn für heute Abend einzuladen. Das letzte Buch heißt Le Populisme en Europe centrale et orientale, un avertissement pour le monde, Fragezeichen, erschienen in Paris 2019. Und natürlich die Verbindung zwischen Populismus und Krise der Sozialdemokratie in den drei genannten Ländern war für uns im Besonderen relevant. Ich äh, will diese kurze äh, Vorstellung des Vertragenen äh, äh, damit äh, schließen, indem ich noch erwähne, dass äh, seine Kompetenzen, seine Expertise auch äh, in den Medien äh, gefragt sind. Äh, er ist regelmäßig dann äh, zu sehen oder zu hören in verschiedenen äh, Zeitungen und äh, Radios und äh, bei Mediapart äh, auch. Und er gehört zu äh, einigen Think Tank oder äh, Stiftungen, die auch äh, grundsätzlich darüber nachdenken, wie die europäische politische Landschaft äh, sich äh, entwickelt. Äh, Roman Krakowski, nous sommes très heureux äh, de t'entendre. Ähm, der Vortrag wird auf äh, Englisch äh, sein, aber dazu werden auch ein paar Slides auch äh, gezeigt. Für die Reihenfolge, dann kommt der Vortrag, anschließend eine Diskussion und wenn Sie sich als Zuhörer an der Diskussion teilnehmen wollen. Sie haben zwei Möglichkeiten. Entweder Sie schreiben während des Vortrags eine Frage in dem Chat oder während der Diskussion, dann äh, übernehmen Sie oder benutzen Sie diese Funktion Hand äh, heben. Und dann werde ich als Moderator natürlich äh, alle äh, dann Fragenden äh, auf meine Liste nehmen. Dann wünschen wir uns alle einen schönen Vortrag. Roman, tu as la parole. Et euh, nous sommes très heureux, curieux de t'écouter. Okay, so, uh, dear, uh, dear Mathias, dear Pierre, uh, Beate, thank you very much for inviting me for, the, for this conference. And thank you for Thomas for all the technical assistance to make uh, this possible. Um, I would like maybe uh, uh, start with... Um, with a sort of paradox. Um, in, uh, at the end of the uh, 80s, um, the fall of the Berlin Wall was celebrated as a victory for democracy over the past uh, major total, uh, total, totalitarian ideology of the 20th century. And today, 30, 30 years later, Central European countries, which in the meantime became the members of uh, European Union, are falling one after the other into a new kind of authoritarianism, that of illiberal democracies. Uh, most of them have experienced an economic boom over the past uh, uh, 
um, 20, uh, 20 years with growth rates two or three times are higher than in the formerly 15 members European Union. And uh, yet xenophobia and intolerance are at, uh, at their highest, especially among the young. So the starting point uh, for me uh, uh, was uh, to understand how uh, these paradoxes can be explained. And uh, especially uh, when uh, we have a um, look uh, on what is going on in Central and Eastern Europe since uh, 2000, 2010, uh, I uh, put, uh, um, I shared with you the, this um, quotation of um, uh, Viktor Orban from Baile Tusnat speech um, uh, from 2014, um, where um, one of the this uh, uh, new populist leaders violently lashed out at liberal democracy, um, and uh, um, instead of uh, liberal democratic order. Orban proposed uh, to rebuild the national community according to illiberal principles, positioning, positioning, positioning himself as one of the world's leaders of this alternative movement to uh, liberalism. So uh, why uh, are democracies in Central Europe declaring war on liberalism and why at this precise moment in time? It is true that between 2010 and 17, populists rose to power uh, in all countries in the area. And in certain cases, uh, these successes were facilitated by economic difficulties, for, in, uh, for instance, in Hungary before 2010. But this economic orient, economics-oriented interpretation does not explain why populist, uh, uh, populist leaders rose to power in countries such as Czech Republic, um, which was going through an economic boom over the past 15 years, nor in the case of Hungary, where they were re-elected once the economic situation had improved. So beyond national specificities, these victories reveal, I think, above all, a fear for the existence of the nation, whose protection becomes a, a sort of uh, imperative. And this... Um, uh, this... Um, um, this... Um, uh, oh, okay, so I will come, come back and try to uh, share the file. Is it, uh, is it working now? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, is it working? Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, and this, uh, I think that this fear for the existence of the nation is uh, uh, the cumulative effect of uh, several factors. The first one um, is um, uh, the feeling of being uh, uh, victims of uh, globalization. Um, for a long time, Central and Eastern Europe remained uh, uh, on the sidelines of globalization. Two major experiences where this part of Europe was integrated into wider structures the German sphere of influence during the uh, 30s and 40s and the Soviet bloc uh, uh, since the end of the 40s were not uh, positive ones. And after uh, 1989, this region, this area uh, again found itself exposed to, to global phenomena. The liberal principles advocating a return to minimal state regulation of the economy and uh, of society had led to an unraveling of the social welfare system which had guaranteed universal welfare coverage, jobs and pensions for uh, nearly 40 years during the socialist period. And privatizations and the introduction of market mechanism uh, during the um, 90s led to a profound restructuring of economies and exposed these countries to a global competition. And consequently, during the 90s, this region experienced a serious economic crisis particularly in the Balkans and in Russia, where uh, at, the, at the end of the 90s, the gross domestic product per capita uh, hardly reached 22% of that of Western Europe. A new phenomenon emerged, that of unemployment, and uh, with it a dramatic increase of social inequalities. Uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, uh, in the very moment where the former class identities and solidarities from the uh, socialist period no longer mattered 
and the principles of uh, equality and social justice uh, that somehow guaranteed uh, were guaranteed by the re redistributive socialist uh, state were replaced by the principle of every man for himself. And suddenly for many Central and Eastern Europeans leading a normal life, similar to that of Westerners and synonymous with prosperity had proved to be much more difficult than expected. With a uh, qualified and uh, inexpensive labor force, these can, uh, countries quickly became the cheap workforce workshop of the West, especially in some uh, traditional subcontracting sectors, such as the automotive or textile industries. And uh, even if their entry into the European Union between 2004 and 2007 um, led to a return uh, to prosperity, uh, equality, um, it, it uh, equally um, um, brought a difficulty uh, to assert themselves in the face of the bigger, uh, bigger countries. And uh, this resulted in the feeling that uh, they were not being treated fairly, equally, at, uh, and that uh, they were once again relegated to the periphery of Europe, a position they had been seeking to escape from since the 19th century. So this, I think this is the first uh, factor, uh, the uh, integration of Central and Eastern Europe into uh, the globalization. The second one is, uh, of course, um, dramatic uh, demographic decline. In the 70s and 80s, Central and Eastern Europe recorded higher fertility rates than uh, Western Europe, but also higher mortality rates and the stagnation of life expectancy, mainly due to a cardiovascular diseases and cancers, that the declining social uh, socialist welfare system was no uh, longer able to cope with. And after uh, uh, the fall of communism, with the economic crisis and the period of political instability, mortality increased significantly, especially among men, while fertility uh, literally collapsed. In East Germany, for example, the number of children per woman halved in just a few years. Uh, at the same time, uh, these countries have, ex have been experiencing a mass population uh, exodus. Uh, it is often the youngest, most educated and most enterprising people who left. And the uh, differences in living standards and salaries, um, which can uh, be increased four to tenfold just by crossing over the border, uh, often incited these departures. Throughout Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the cumulative net migration over the last uh, 30 uh, years has uh, exceeded 10% of the population. And uh, some countries, such as Bulgaria and uh, Romania, lost uh, between 15 and 20% uh, of population. And what is uh, maybe uh, the most um, um, striking is to see that according to uh, estimates from uh, OCD, from um, United Nations uh, or uh, World Bank, uh, the top 10 countries in the world whose population uh, is, uh, is expected to decline most rapidly in the world in the coming decades are all situated in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, in Bul Bulgaria, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the country which is at the top of the of the ranking, the population is expected to fall from 7 million in 2017 to 5.4 million by 2020, which means uh, the loss of 20, 23% of population, a situation which is unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh, in times of peace. And I think this trend uh, is at the root of the democratic panic and identity fears that fuel populism. The third factor behind the fear of, for the existence of the nation is geological, uh, geopolitical insecurity. Now, after 1989, uh, 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 liberal democracy and the market economy was imposed, um, imported into the region by the major powers that uh, are the United States and uh, the European Union. And Washington and Brussels found themselves sometime, uh, somehow in the role of guarant, guardian and tutor of democracy and uh, capitalism. And uh, since uh, 2000, uh, 2000, the geopolitical situation has changed and uh, 
these two uh, powers have been uh, sinking into a deep crisis in the United States, 2008 financial crisis and the exorbitant cost of American military involvement overseas led the White House to reconsider its diplomatic uh, engagements um, abroad. And uh, this process of retreat um, from um, world uh, affairs started even before Donald Trump launched uh, uh, an isola his isolationist policies. We will see how the situation with, uh, will evolve uh, with the new um, uh, establishment in the Un United States, but probably they will not uh, change uh, radically uh, uh, this trend. And in Europe, the wave of Islamist attacks, the 2008 financial crisis, Brexit, and the migrant crisis uh, have considerably weakened the United, uh, the, uh, the European Union. Um, lastly, over the past few years, uh, new powers emerged. Um, and I'm thinking, of course, uh, uh, to Russia, which uh, since the, uh, the Crimea crisis 2014 uh, and the support for separatists in Eastern Ukraine is re reaffirming uh, again its role as, as a major power in Central and Eastern Europe and uh, China. Uh, which uh, uh, since 2013 is building its Silk Road, a project of worldwide colon colonization through a China-centered trading network, where Central and Eastern Europe, especially the Balkans, uh, is seen as a gateway to European markets. And the countries situated on, the route, uh, on its route are simply not able to cha uh, challenge the strength of the Chinese uh, influence. And it, in, in most countries in the region, this geopolitical insecurity has contributed to the weakening of the image of liberal democracy and capitalism. For some, such as uh, Viktor Orban, Vladimir Putin's authoritarian policies and anti-Western ideology serve as a model to follow in order to protect the community. For others, the rise of the Russian threat is helping to tilt votes towards a more authoritarian government able to protect the nation from external threats, as is the case in Poland uh, with uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski. And uh, uh, the um, migrant crisis from 2015-2016 had led to a radicalization of the opposition between the existential social order and the various groups that considered themselves as marginalized by this uh, order, as a sort of losers um, of um, of uh, liberal democracy. It has quickly become the primary subject of political debate, and uh, I'm speaking about the migrant crisis, uh, in all countries in Central Europe, um, even in, in these countries where, uh, that were not situated on the migrant routes, such as Poland or Czech Republic. Um, and uh, I think this helps to understand um, why um, the migrant has become a figure of uh, realistic and pragmatic liberal democracy who in the name of equality demands the same rights as everyone else but to the detriment of countries situated on the margins of uh, Europe. And I gave you here um, the quotation from Orban's uh, speech in September 2015, we are in the middle of the crisis, uh, where uh, Orban denounced the hypocrisy of liberals faced with the challenge to um, um, see themselves as good people according to, uh, to their own principles and at the same time uh, unable to protect the standards of living which uh, they have achieved so far. Uh, and according to Orban, it is no longer possible for Europe, uh, in Europe to both see ourselves as good in the liberal sense and to live in prosperity unless we sacrifice one uh, for the sake of the other. And um, the low amount of support that Western liberal democracies have provided at this specific time to regions countries to manage the humanitarian crisis caused by the influx of millions of migrants gives a certain weight to this uh, argument. But what is interesting, if we analyze uh, how uh, um, the um, uh, how this migrant crisis was dealt with. Um, uh, by uh, political allies in the region, uh, in uh, Central Europe. We can see that migrant became also a figure of capitalism. Uh, and I quote uh, uh, Viktor Orban, because it is not in fact 
looking, he's not looking for a refuge uh, in life or that situation, but a uh, better quality of life. And since they are merely economic migrants, uh, they do not deserve the help and solidarity that we should give to, uh, to a loved ones in distress. Finally, the migrant becomes a figure of globalization, an uprooted person who, I quote, is no longer bound to their land and their past as strongly as they once were. And according to Orban, this uprooting is one of the main dangers to the survival of national community. But above all, because of its cultural and uh, religious difference, the migrant represents a danger to European culture, which, according to uh, um, Orban or Kaczynski, is based on Christian values. And I quote, uh, um, in Budapest's view, uh, this risk of the great replacement justified the building of an anti-migrant wall along the border with Serbia and Croatia in autumn 2015, followed by ones uh, bordering Slovenia and Croatia. And this uh, perceived risk also led to the region's country to unanimously reject the uh, migrants quota um, despite the near non-existence of Muslim uh, population in the four countries of this area. And I think that the coming together of these different factors has elicited a feeling uh, of fear for the existence of the nation and uh, unleashed what I would call the existential crisis. The whole Europe seems to be affected by this existential crisis, especially since the economic crisis and the UK's, the UK's vote on Brexit called uh, into question the European project. And I, uh, I gave you here the quotation from the State of the Union speech of uh, uh, Jean-Claude uh, Juncker uh, in 2016, uh, where he, um, is, uh, he um, underlined this uh, threat of existential crisis of the whole European Union. Uh, but I think that the effects of this existential crisis are uh, today most uh, visible in Central and Eastern Europe, most likely, might likely because uh, this part of European continent is made up of small nations, and I quote uh, Milan Kundera, whose very existence may be put into question at any moment, uh, they could disappear and they know it. Uh, and uh, in his uh, article, uh, Kidnapped West, uh, um, I think Kundera um, puts, um, uh, underlines something very, uh, very important that the history of Central and Eastern Europe is largely that of a defeated, of victims and of outsiders. And I quote him, it is, uh, it, uh, it is this disabused view of uh, history that is the source of their culture, of their wisdom, of the non-serious spirit that mocks uh, grandeur and uh, glory, states uh, Kundera. And I think that this fragility uh, is at the root of what this, uh, what the population of this part of Europe has best brought to European civilization with the uh, writers such as Robert Musil, Franz Kafka or the Vienna Secession. But at the same time, this same fragility uh, uh, has also given birth to the worst monsters. It is in this part of Europe that the two world wars were born and the most atrocious genocides of the 20th century took place. And uh, I think that um, th th these different criticisms of, um, of the uh, system without any uh, apparent relation to one another find a common denominator, the liberalism. And uh, I gave you the quotation from uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski's speech to the same uh, from 2006, where um, uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski lashed out at lumpen, lumpen liberalism, um, a form of ultra-liberalism introduced in the 90s that caused, I quote, the worst social pathologies such as crime, corruption, and moral laxity. And I think this anti-liberal discourse gives meaning a sort of coherence to the struggles that are uh, in reality very different and uh, they uh, that don't uh, share uh, any uh, point in common uh, and i think it this is the first starting point um helping to establish um, a, a creation of a new uh, 
community and new people. In 2014, uh, the Polish Law and Justice uh, uh, Party program um, returned to the notion um, of uh, dignity. And I think this is something very, very important. I quote, dignity is the most elementary foundation of the rights of the human person. Uh, and uh, we must say no to an economy of exclusion and social inequality, which deprives people of, um, of this uh, dignity. Uh, I quote, such an economic chaos, the law supports the strong, so the mighty prey open the weak. As a result of the situation, the great majority of the population ex is excluded and marginalized without work, without perspective, without a way out. And I think uh, this analysis of the situation creates the feeling that the existing social system does not satisfy the demands of the greatest number of people to lead, I quote, a normal life. Uh, and that it is therefore necessary to break with it and build a new system. And I think this is the, at this point, that the process of building the populist nation, the new people, new community uh, begins to overcome the existential threat, the existential crisis, and to strengthen the national community, it is necessary to break with the existing social system. Instead of the liberal principle that stipulates, and I quote uh, um, Viktor Orban, that we are free to do anything that does not violate another person's freedom, which in reality always ends up with the, weakers, with the weaker being stepped open by the stronger party, Orban proposes to rebuild the community according to illiberal principles. And in July 2014, uh, at uh, Fides uh, Summer University, he explained uh, that the state, the new state, does not uh, deny foundation, uh, fun, uh, 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 fundamental values of liberalism, such as freedom, but it does not make this ideology a central el element of state organization. And in September 2015, Orban returned uh, back to this idea. According to him, the universal principles of individual freedom and equality that liberalism advocates would destroy, I quote, uh, that which we can nurture uh, in our children, the dignified old age we can give our parents and when possible, the protection we can give uh, our country and culture. And uh, in the illiberal era, uh, it is the national Christian ideology uh, with the responsibility towards uh, one's own community that is made as an absolute principle. And I quote, first of all, we are responsible for our children, then uh, for our parents, then come those uh, with whom we live in our village or town, then comes our country, and then uh, everyone else may come. And uh, the Poland's uh, uh, Law and Justice Party uh, uh, says the same thing when it states in his 2014 program uh, that uh, the concept uh, of community refers to various social groups, but the most important of them uh, are the family and uh, the nation. While the family is the fundamental structure of social life in which are realized persons' most essential needs, the nation represents the broadest social group uh, uh, constituting an effective foundation for a democratic political community. And this way of thinking, the relationship between the individual and the community creates a feeling of belonging. And I think this is really important, the feeling of belonging and thus strengthens the weakened community. Um, the criticism of liberal democracy echoed by a large number of social actors does play a triple role. First, it creates a space where particular demands can be heard because they are articulated around the message that links them to each other and making, in this way, making them intelligible while preserving their particularities. Uh, second, it also places uh, these demands in a hierarchy, um, in a certain, uh, it articulates them in a certain hierarchy and makes it possible to, uh, to build what I would call the ideology of illiberal democracy of populism. And lastly, since criticism of liberal democracy follows alternative political routes with a strong anti-system connotation, this criticism systematically appealed to, to a little people 
um, those who are or who feel excluded from the system, which further reinforces their populist uh, nature. And in order to strengthen the national community, uh, national sovereignty needs to be uh, reestablished. In February 2018, uh, during the, uh, his State of the Nation speech, Orban stated, I, I quote, a precondition of all future plan, plans is that we are free to follow our own path. Only independent nations, which are not uh, at the mercy of others, can follow their uh, own path. Homeland is an archer needed by everyone in their hearts. And in spite of attacks and mockery, patriots deserve recognition for uh, again and again lowering their anchor, for telling us uh, to our face uh, uh, that the homeland uh, comes before all else, or in an updated form, borrowed from uh, the Americans, Hungary first. In practical terms, this nation first approach is uh, translated into uh, restoring national preference when it comes to the economy. And since the coming to power in Poland in 2015, the peace has worked, has been working to ensure the country's economic and energy independence, especially in relation to Russia. It provides extensive funding for infrastructure uh, construction and agricultural development, particularly in un underdeveloped uh, areas. But economic nationalism also involves favoring the old coal-based energy uh, model, regardless of any other consideration, including an environmental ones. And according to World Health Organization in 2016, uh, more than 30 of the 50 most polluted European cities were situated in Poland. Second, uh, second, um, um, second axis uh, for work in order to, um, um, to strengthen the community is to halt democratic decline in these countries. Uh, and uh, um, central European governments uh, adopted since 2015-2020 uh, uh, aggressive pro-natalist poli policies. In Poland, the peace is uh, setting up a highly comprehensive social benefits um, program called 50 plus to encourage people to have large families and lobbying against abortion rights. In Hungary, the parliament amended uh, the law on the rights to vote in 2012, enabling Hungarian minorities uh, uh, in uh, neighbor, uh, neighborhood countries to vote. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, last year, the Prime Minister announced a series of uh, measures uh, uh, going to the uh, same direction, strengthening uh, uh, um, pro-natalist policies uh, with bank loans uh, uh, favoring um, uh, couples, assistance to buy houses and family cars, income taxes, exemption for mothers with large families, etc. Uh, the, uh, the second um, uh, uh, the second uh, way um, to strengthen the power, um, the, the, to reinforce the national com community is to strengthen the power of the nation state. In order to protect the people, illiberal democracies need to strengthen the power of the nation state. And because the dangerous situation uh, that the nation is supposedly in uh, is perceived to be a radical, the measures to get out of the situation must also be, uh, be radical. And um, uh, in 2014, the, the Peace Party program states that, uh, I quote, the state uh, is an organization of a global nature, which means that uh, it encompasses uh, in its activities all other organizations and social communities, including ethnic uh, communities. Um, it draws uh, its legitimacy from uh, uh, its subordination to the nation. Uh, I quote, its subordinate uh, role encompasses every function, but for, uh, for us of particular importance is the defense of life, security, liberty, and solidarity based on justice, which is uh, uh, with which civil, uh, civic equality is uh, tightly bound. And uh, I think this new definition of uh, the state encompassing of all aspects of life uh, might be inspired by the notion of the total state uh, conceived in the 30s by Carl Schmitt. According to this uh, uh, jurist and philosopher, uh, in order to ensure the well-being of the masses, the competences of the state uh, 
were progressively widened during the late 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And this process led, according to him, to the confusion between the state and the economy that ended up in weakening the state by diluting its power into the welfare and made it in this way permeable to subordinate pressures from a multitude of interest uh, groups. And still, according to Schmidt, to break with this uh, process, it is necessary to reestablish a total state in the sense, I quote, in the sense of quality and political energy. In, in other words, in order to, uh, to free the economy from excessive public spending, from high, uh, high daring social legislation, from state interventionist, interventionism, uh, one would need something other than the minimal and neutral state advocated by, by liberalism. In a certain way, uh, we would need more of the state, only a state uh, which concentrates in its hands all the power of modern technology, the instruments of mass communications, allowing it to control bodies and minds, only this state can succeed in silencing the subversive forces within, uh, within it. And for that, it, it is necessary, according to Schmidt, to um, uh, revisit certain fundamental rights and traditional liberal conceptions, in particular, the freedom of the press, the government by discussion, and the equality of all before, uh, before the law. Finally, so, I think um, uh, if we look back uh, uh, to this uh, illiberal conception from the um, interwar period, I think we will uh, better understand uh, what is going on in Central and Eastern Europe today. Because in no country in the, uh, in the region today, uh, the role of nation state is uh, threatened using openly uh, authoritarian methods. There is no censorship. Uh, no uh, bans on demonstration, no open police intervention, no pressure to carry, uh, carry out acts displaying uh, uh, the allegiance to the new regime. In this sense, illiberal uh, regimes in Central Europe still remain democratic. But to strengthen the power of the nation state, uh, these illiberal democracies attacked the counterpowers that are the media and the law by changing the justice system and by bringing market mechanism into play. For example, but uh, I just re uh, remind you uh, what you uh, certainly know, to reduce the independence of the press, populist um, and the media, populist governments rewrite the law. This is the, uh, the way uh, Poland used uh, um, with the Small Media Act from 2015 and Big Media Act uh, 2016, which allowed the government to appoint and dismiss the uh, board of directors of public media de facto putting an end to their independence. Another technique involves using market mechanism to create economic imbalances uh, such as in Hungary where the state subsidy policies for the media are leading to the uh, outright disappearance of certain opposition newspapers including the main left-wing daily uh, Nepsa Bacak in 2016 or Index last year. And today, more than 90% of the public and private media uh, belong to Fidesz uh, and uh, oligarchs close to, to, to the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, um, speaking about Hungary and uh, Poland, but the same process is taking place in other countries in the, in the uh, area, uh, such as Czech Republic uh, or Slovakia, where newspapers and magazines such as Sme, Pravda and Reflex are owned by groups close to the government. In Czech Republic, populist Prime Minister Andrei Babiš uh, alone uh, through his Mafra media group owns the country's two main daily newspapers, Mada Fronta Dnes and Lidove Novini. And what I think, uh, what I would like to, um, um, uh, to uh, draw your attention to is that the result of this process is a skewed media landscape where publicly funded media produce a discourse that paints the government as the guarantor of uh, national sovereignty and the opposition as the country's enemies. Um, they even go so far as to spread false information. For example, uh, in Poland, where Tomasz Piatek, a journalist uh, of Gazeta Wyborcza, who was, um, uh, was called paranoid, alcoholic and drug addict when uh, he was, uh, um, uh, uh, he was, um, uh, publishing a series of articles on the Russian connections of the uh, defense minister, uh, Antony uh, Macierewicz, in 2018. 
and in Slovakia, uh, journalist Jan Kuciak and his fiance uh, Martina Kushnirova, who in investigated uh, uh, on the connections between political and economic circles, were murdered in uh, 2018. Um, but what is, what is the most uh, uh, important uh, is, uh, I think that by targeting uh, the media and the justice system, Central European uh, illiberal governments attack the heart of the democratic system. Uh, because the role of media and uh, the justice uh, is to um, encroach open the power of the other actors who intervene in the public sphere, first and foremost to the state, and thus to ensure that everyone in the, uh, has the opportunity to speak in public in complete equality and without fear of persecution. This is the role of what we call in English the checks and balances system, where one power limit uh, the parameters of uh, the power of other actors intervening in public. And even if in reality, the state and me or you uh, or a political party, uh, we are not equal in the public sphere, uh, we must uh, behave as uh, if this were the case. And um, this situation of uh, equality uh, guaranteed by a uh, 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 the justice system and by uh, the freedom of speech enables actors representing particular interests to be able to discuss freely um, among themselves and thus together develop the notion of general interest that can compete uh, the one that uh, is um, embodied by uh, those who are in power. And precisely controlling the media and justice system um, um, the control of media and justice system uh, ensures that the government has a, uh, ensures the government the hegemonic position in the public sphere. It allows it to impose its values and way of thinking as the only legitimate one. And uh, uh, this situation is reminiscent of the control of the mass uh, means of uh, expression under communism, with one difference maybe that the government does not need to uh, in, uh, install censorship or to imprison its opponents in a market economy uh, where the uh, press groups and the media are subject to fierce economic competition uh, it is uh, uh, enough for the state to favor some to the detriment of the others through subsidy policies for example and the economic imbalances uh, thus uh, this situation creates can turn out to be lethal uh, for certain actors in the media landscape and I think we should uh, go back to um, 18, uh, 1984 of George Orwell, who reminds us of the dangers of this process leading to the close control of communication by the state, uh, where um, uh, by distorting reality, newspeak um, uh, makes it impossible to criticize the state and to express potentially subversive ideas. It aims even more, uh, it aims to prevent even the idea of the criticism because uh, by creating what we call today alternative facts. Uh, and the very name of the ruling party in Poland, law and justice, provides a perfect example for this. It expresses the exact opposite of what this party is actually doing by constantly violating the law and placing the courts uh, under control. And the danger of this process is that the true ceases to be the organizing force of uh, these societies calling into question the very possibility of social progress. Because in order to improve things, uh, you need first uh, to tell what is not working properly. Uh, and to, uh, to have the possibility to tell it, you need a, a freedom of speech. Uh, but uh, uh, above all, the result of these policies is a state that is extremely centralized around the figure of the leader and his political family. And in Hungary, um, uh, the Orban family is worth 23 million euro, according to Forbes uh, ranking. And uh, some of his uh, friends, such as Lawrence Mesaros, an old school friend uh, and the uh, trained gas fitter, has in few years become the fifth wealthier, wealthiest math man in the country. And this concentration of wealth in the hands of few oligarchs is unprecedented in Hungary's modern history, sometimes leading to be uh, described as a mafia state or cartel republic. Um, and uh, this is how uh, illiberal democracies uh, slide uh, 
slowly towards authoritarianism because um, the hegemonic position of the party uh, allows one actor in public sphere to impose his uh, uh, his values, his uh, program, his project for society as the only legitimate and allows, um, for example, uh, uh, Fidesz government um, to um, uh, launch a new uh, culture camp uh, since uh, 2018 by opening several fronts against the nation's internal and external uh, enemies. Uh, and I mean, uh, and uh, I'm thinking about, um, uh, I, I, I mean against civil society actors such as uh, NGO that since 2018s, uh, 18 uh, has to uh, declare themselves supported from abroad if they receive more than uh, 24,000 euro per year uh, in subsidies. Or um, uh, I remind you of the campaign against Central European Universities uh, founded uh, at the beginning of the 90s by Georges Soros, um, which was relocated to Vienna last year. Or uh, even the um, uh, particularly violent, uh, violent uh, a campaign against uh, uh, George Soros and Open Society Foundation with a, uh, with a strong anti-Semitic um, 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 aspects. Uh, similarly, gender studies uh, are denigrated as foreign ideology, and today it is impossible to study, gen uh, to, to study gender studies in, in Hungary, and maybe tomorrow it will be impossible uh, in Poland uh, as well. Um, so, um, in order to, uh, to conclude, I, I would um, just say that um, this existential crisis and the populist responses to it are not specific uh, to Central, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, for example, in France, Netherlands, in the United States, in Germany, similar populist leaders and movements are emerging, placing national interests above, above everything else. And when the French conservative public intellectual Eric Zemmour affirms that uh, when you are one person of the world population and when we have 1.5 billion Africans at our doors who in the name of the rights of man want to create, uh, want to come to France, I say the rights of man are that of France, uh, what he's saying is not so much different from uh, Viktor Orban. And in this, uh, in this light, Central and Eastern Europe can be seen as a sort of prediction of European fate and uh, what is happening here today uh, as a warning for the rest of the continent. But I think, and I would like to, uh, to finish on a more positive note, uh, I think that um, it can be also seen as a sort of opportunity because uh, when we look carefully at, at uh, what is uh, going on in Central Europe, we can see also thousands of people taking to the streets in Poland and Hungary to defend the constitution, to, to defend the rights of uh, women, to dispose of their bodies or the LGBTs to uh, live according to, uh, to their own uh, identity. In Slovakia, in Czech Republic, uh, Czech Republic people march uh, in the street to protest, uh, to protect the press freedom after the assassination in February 2018 of Jan Kuciak uh, and his partner. In Romania or in Bulgaria, people demonstrate against corruption that plagues their countries. And um, everywhere, uh, these uh, uh, are the biggest public demonstrations since uh, 1989. And I think this tremendous energy reveals a new social dynamic. And we should follow closely what is happening on the streets of Warsaw, Budapest or Bratislava, because the renewal of democracy will most likely come from here. And uh, I think in this sense, Central and Eastern Europe is a sort of laboratory of Europe, where the European existential crisis reaches today uh, its highest peak, but where also uh, the solution uh, to this crisis might be elaborated. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Raman, for uh, this uh, very rich and uh, very uh, uh, deep uh, presentation of the uh, specificity of the political and uh, cultural and social uh, landscape of uh, this uh, part of Europe. 
Um, and uh, thank you also for uh, your presentation of uh, uh, many uh, uh, long perspectives and many facts which uh, had a, a specific uh, role uh, in these uh, countries before and after joining the uh, European uh, community and for the way uh, you could uh, make a distinction between uh, tradition, between interpretation and uh, uh, between a uh, new... Sorry, sorry. So um, okay. I, I, I resume um, my uh, two thanks uh, for you, Raman, for uh, your um, paper, uh, because uh, you could present uh, a specificity of uh, facts of tradition, but also of interpretation of the reality um, in these uh, uh, countries before and after joining the uh, European uh, community. And uh, as an historian uh, of the medieval society, I uh, could learn uh, a lot of uh, uh, new uh, uh, facts and uh, 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 new uh, reflection. Um, and uh, as a medievist, I uh, remember that uh, the denomination of the so-called uh, Visegrad group uh, is uh, remember of this meeting of the three uh, uh, kings of uh, Poland, uh, Bohemia, and uh, Hungary uh, in Visegrad uh, 1335. And uh, it uh, brings me to my first uh, question before I open the discussion. And there is uh, uh, already a lot of uh, questions on the chat. And please don't hesitate to use the function rise hand if you want to uh, ask a question. My uh, first uh, question could be remembering of uh, this uh, Visegrad group. Um, if uh, the history uh, is playing a, a specific, a particular uh, a rule in the perception of a special identity, a special space, a special tradition of uh, uh, another way to uh, develop uh, or to have a long historicity in this east part of Europe. And if yes, is, is that the ancient, for instance, the medieval history, or is that uh, also a modern history? But uh, what upon this modern socialist uh, 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 past of these um, countries? Uh, thank you, thank you, Piers, uh, for the the question. I think yes, history is playing a, um, a fundamental role in the um, in uh, in this illiberal turn. Um, and um, I, I think we should, uh, if we want to understand what's, uh, what's going on in uh, uh, today's, uh, uh, in, in, um, uh, in, to, uh, in today's Central Europe, uh, we should uh, put um, uh, this process uh, in a wider long-term perspective. Because uh, what I uh, try, uh, try to um, underline, uh, for example, with, uh, in my essay about populism in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, where I um, uh, take a, a long-term perspective, even if I talk a lot about uh, uh, illiberal turn uh, today, uh, I think that history might uh, uh, give us uh, some interesting um, perspective, uh, because um, illiberal uh, democracies and their uh, Proposal to um, um, to break with liberal old order, uh, with the Western order, which was uh, imported during the 80s and 90s. I was talk talking much about 1990s, but uh, in reality, the switch to uh, liberal model started already uh, uh, during the late 70s and 80s. If you have a look on, uh, uh, for example, Poland and Hungary during the 80s, uh, the um, 
uh, they already started to reduce the role of the state in economy. And by uh, 1985, about uh, one third of the GDP of Hungary comes from uh, uh, private sector already. So the, the shift towards liberal order started already in the 80s. If you have a look on the political elites uh, of this uh, late socialist period, you can see that they all uh, completed their education in Western universities, mm -hmm. in Oxford, Harvard, Cambridge, Yale, uh, especially in sectors such as economy. And uh, uh, so um, what, I, uh, what uh, historical perspective uh, helps us to understand that uh, illiberal democracies and their proposal to break with liberal system is in fact uh, uh, an alternative model uh, of modernity uh, a third one, the, the first uh, alternative uh, model uh, of modernity was experienced with uh, rural uh, uh, economies during the late 19th, uh, 19th century and the uh, interwar period where uh, um, agrarian parties uh, uh, dominated politics in this area. And uh, uh, these parties, these uh, truly mass parties, uh, 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 proposed to um, uh, rebuild economies on uh, a rural model, on an agrarian model, putting uh, uh, rural villages and uh, um, peasants uh, to the front. Mm -hmm. So this was the first uh, alternative to modernity, which was uh, uh, taking its distance from a Western liberal model at this, at this time. The second one, of course, uh, is uh, uh, the fascist or Nazi model, which was also um, um, an alternative model of modernity, uh, different from liberal one. Uh, we were talking about um, Karl Schmidt, but uh, uh, if we have a look uh, on uh, uh, economic um, uh, model of fascism or Nazism, it, uh, it also strengthened the role of the state and uh, uh, in a very different way from liberal model. So this, this is the second one. The third, uh, the third one was uh, the communist model, which also uh, tried to uh, break with the liberal system and uh, modernize these societies according to other alternative principles. So what I want to say is that uh, illiberal democracies in this way, uh, 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 appear to be a sort of uh, fourth uh, uh, temptate to um, um, modernize societies uh, according to a non-Western model, trying to uh, to find um, principles to uh, modernize societies which are um, um, uh, not external, but which are part, which, which are part of these societies. Uh, and um, uh, what I tried, uh, tried to uh, stress was uh, that uh, illiberal movements is about, um, for me, uh, mainly uh, about two questions, how to uh, bring economic uh, progress, how to guarantee economic progress, and how to build strong political communities. And liberal model, uh, um, and this is the conclusion they, they, uh, they came to uh, after the uh, transition period of the 80s and 90s, liberal model is not guaranteeing neither a sort of social justice and uh, equality, uh, neither uh, helps to build a strong political communities. So we have to uh, rebuild a new, uh, we have to um, uh, uh, rebuild co uh, economies and societies according to alternative models, which is a liberal model. So um, his history is putting uh, what is uh, going on in, uh, in Central Europe today in a wider um, prospect and helps to um, um, maybe to, um, how to say it, um, um, put it in the, in the right place. I think it's a part of a much larger pro, uh, pro, uh, process. Thank you, Raman. Um, we received already uh, several uh, questions in the chat. Uh, I uh, will begin with the first. 
uh, I read it. Uh, uh, what do you think of the idea of having the true democratic members of the EU voting to dissolve the union and then reconstituting an EU 2.0? Uh, uh, zero without these illiberal members. These illiberal members are cashing in on the benefits and are net recipients while refusing to assume the responsibility for the joint commitments, for instance, acceptance of refugees, etc. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, um, the European Union had several parts, or, uh, or um, uh, the. Um, I think th this this might be a, a very dangerous process because uh, it might even uh, um, uh, give some reason for these countries uh, to feel uh, marginalized uh, and uh, um, relegated to the periphery of uh, of, of Europe. Uh, I think the. The, the true challenge is, is to make uh, uh, understand uh, the population in uh, Central and Eastern Europe that the best guarantee for the pro, um, for the progress is uh, uh, um, freedom of speech, uh, the rule of law, um, and uh, that um, um, it is not um, going to marginalize them, uh, but on the contrary. Uh, uh, help them to um, improve the quality of their life and uh, uh, help them to, uh, to live um, uh, according to their, uh, to their wishes. Uh, so, it, it, and uh, uh, excluding them from uh, European Union is, uh, I think, uh, the wrong way of doing things because it, it would just uh, uh, reinforce uh, this feeling of being uh, on, uh, relegated on the margins of the, of the continent. This first question came from uh, uh, Michael Oppenheim. Um, I don't see any raised hand at the moment. Don't hesitate to do that. Uh, so, uh, Sandra Zoyver. Yes, there are two, Sandra Zoyver and myself. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see it on my on my screen. So, uh, ladies first, uh, Sandra Seubert, uh, uh, dann uh, uh, können Sie die Frage stellen. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this interesting talk. I'm, uh, despite your answer, I'm still struggling how you perceive of the relation between liberalism and democracy, because I'm, I think uh, the term illiberal democracy is, uh, is uh, deeply mis misleading. It seems to suggest that there is a type of democracy that is uh, just different. Um, and you, you, yeah, you, several times you said they remain democratic. And I was wondering how can um, yeah, suppression of media and free judiciary be called democratic because oligarchy is also, um, and um, um, I mean, um, centralizing economic power is as problematic as um, political power. I would just call it authoritarian uh, moves um, and leave this illiberal democracy term to, to Orban, but uh, uh, don't help him by repeating it and calling it like this because it, uh, it, does, it doesn't do justice to what democracy means. The other question I have is I'm struggling with the existential crisis expression. And I was wondering how this perception, I, I could really understand that this is a framing of, um, uh, yeah, and of a national rhetoric that tries to make people think that the nation is under threat by what is it under threat, as you explained it. Um, how does the European Union, for example, free movement regime come in here? Because I, it's hard for me to understand how this tiny perception of quotas of, of migrants really threatens the nation. I can really understand that the free movement regime threatens because there are sending and receiving nations. And there's, of course, a move from east to west, from south to north uh, with uh, the free movement of labor. And it seems to me that it's a projection 
uh, to shift this to to some kind of other source, but there is no real in danger of small nations. I mean, look at, at Luxembourg. It, there are many small nations that do not disappear. They are prosperous despite dubious tax models, but they are prosperous. <laughs> Um, so it's rather the, uh, the, the perception of being endangered as a nation um, within Europe. And I, I, I have the suspicion that the free movement regime plays a role here. And the last question is, how do you explain the reluctance to draw uh, red lines on the European level? For example, to throw Fidesz out of the European People's Party. It took such a long time and it was really, I mean, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous process, yeah? I mean, they, they, they keep uh, feeding them. And um, yeah, and, and what do you see, think of the final the rule of law mechanism to do something here, which would move the whole uh, thing forward, kind of anti-corruption, um, yeah, mechanisms. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, what, uh, uh, this uh, the first question about the relation between illiberalism and democracy. Uh, I think um, one uh, uh, way to understand uh, this sort of paradox or oxymoron is uh, to um, understand that of uh, um, how to say it. Um, uh, since the um, national community is in danger, or uh, we uh, we uh, feel or we think that it might be in danger later in the future, we have to protect it, and uh, uh, this um, uh, leads to um, the shift in priorities, uh, where uh, this national first comes before uh, maintaining the uh, liberties or the, the freedom uh, and what we call, uh, what we call uh, the rule of law. So um, uh, the national affairs becomes more important than the respect of, uh, of the justice and the freedom of speech and the, the, the freedom of individuals and uh, the, um, the freedom of women to uh, dispose of their bodies. In order to protect the communities, we should um, um, uh, we should um, 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 suppress the freedom of, um, uh, for example, the uh, uh, abortion laws, uh, reinforce uh, the legislation uh, uh, concerning abortion, etc., in order to uh, reinforce the community, to protect national uh, uh, community. And uh, I, uh, I agree with you that uh, eventually this leads to uh, authoritarian shift. And um, um, and uh, um, uh, I think this uh, the population in uh, societies in Central and Eastern Europe uh, have it right now because if you see uh, uh, the movement for uh, uh, the abortion laws in Poland, uh, uh, the uh, this demonstration for the freedom of press in. Uh, uh, Slovakia or in Czech Republic, uh, I think that people are understood that um, if they um, put the national first and uh, they reinforce the, uh, the role of the state, eventually the state will try to intervene in their very private lives and uh, it will try to, uh, to regulate uh, their um, sexuality, their uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, freedom to do business, uh, etc. So um, I think uh, um, things are changing now. But um, when you were talking about the existential crisis and uh, um, the responses uh, to it, um, I'm not sure that we uh, we have today uh, uh, the right um, recipes to uh, to show that. Um, uh, illiberal uh, democracy is not uh, the right way to um, uh, to respond it. Um, for example, uh, you were talking about Luxembourg, which is a small nation, but uh, um, uh, I would say, uh, let's have a look on Bulgaria, who uh, uh, we lost by uh, 2050, about 40% of their population. So um, if I am Bulgarian, uh, for me, this is uh, an existential threat, and uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, uh, these processes are um, 
um, very uh, um, deeply uh, rooted in uh, these societies. It comes back uh, to um, to 70s or 80s to the to the social system, which was not, uh, not working properly, and um, it's very difficult uh, um, to um, change the direction. Uh, and uh, even if um, um, European Union you know, is trying to um, um, today to um, put a huge amount of money in uh, underdeveloped uh, areas of this part of Europe um, uh, for a Bulgarian or a Romanian uh, who wants to have a decent life, uh, it, uh, it's almost natural to uh, uh, leave the country and uh, go to Spain or uh, to Germany uh, and to work in, um, uh, in hospital uh, uh, having a decent uh, income, while in uh, Bulgaria and Romania he, he could never uh, have this. So uh, when, 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 you, um, when you look on the um, uh, policies, for example, such as in such, as ca such countries in Bulgaria to, to shift this uh, um, demographic, um, uh, demographic crisis, um, in reality, uh, I don't see uh, how they could uh, manage. Uh, uh, on the short term, um, so um, and uh, when you um, when you talk about the the uh, reluctance of uh, European Union, this uh, rule of law mechanism, uh, the principle of conditional conditionality, it's uh, in English. I think this is this is the uh, the fine uh, response uh, to the challenge of uh, that uh, illiberal democracies uh, put on European Union. And in, I think in this way, uh, Central and Eastern Europe is a sort of laboratory because if the, uh, this rule of law mechanism and this principle of conditionality for the budget, European budget and the um, uh, reconstruction uh, uh, budget following the um, coronavirus crisis, uh, was introduced. It was uh, um, introduced mainly today uh, uh, to uh, challenge uh, illiberal tendencies of uh, Poland and uh, uh, and Hungary. But uh, it is not written uh, anywhere that uh, it could not uh, apply to uh, France or Germany or uh, Netherlands uh, in the future. So, uh, in this sense, it uh, reinforces uh, democracy uh, within the European Union. And in, in this sense. Uh, what is going on in Central Europe is uh, a, a huge opportun opportunity uh, to um, rebuild a new kind of democracy or to go even further to reinforce democracy uh, in the whole European Union. Union. Thank you very much. Uh, if you are agree, uh, we can alternate between uh, the uh, question uh, from the chat and uh, the, the uh, hand to ask a question. Uh, the second question in the chat is uh, from Anne-Marie Andrieux, but don't forget that the media landscape in France, where you could believe that the democracy is operating perfectly well, is in the hands also of a few people. And the opinions are very often biased and do not always reflect a diversity of opinions. The lissage of official political statements does not allow for a true debate. Another factor which does not seem to be the case in these illiberal countries is the permanent attack of the media preventing them to give a true and factual news. The muselage of the media is more subtle also in so-called true democracies or liberal countries. I completely agree uh, with you. I was talking about Central and Eastern Europe, but uh, democracy is not working properly uh, uh, in uh, Western countries either. And uh, often we focus on uh, uh, what is going on in Hungary or in Poland, but um, I'm I think it, it uh, could be also an opportunity for us to uh, to to look closely clo uh, closer what's going on in Western Western uh, democracies because uh, democracy is not working uh, properly neither here in Germany or in or in France. When we can speak about media in France, it's uh, it's uh, very clear. 
Hans-Jürgen Pule, uh, it's your turn. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pierre. Thank you very much, uh, Oman, <coughs> Oman, for your uh, very interesting and uh, inspiring uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, one of the obvious questions for any social scientist is how we can explain that so many Central and East European uh, countries seem to be more prone uh, uh, to uh, go from uh, uh, embedded democracy uh, to defective democracy to avoid uh, uh, for uh, Sandra uh, the liberal uh, liberal playing uh, uh, around uh, more prone uh, to fall into democratic defects than the westerners, the southerners, and the northerners. Not all of the easterners. The Baltics, no. Uh, uh, so it, it, has, it appears to be the, the bigger ones and uh, uh, the uh, older uh, uh, nationalists in a way. And my question would be, uh, what is the particular weight of socioeconomic factors and of the syndrome you have called existential fears compared to other factors, which we also might need for explaining uh, these uh, developments. Uh, and uh, then, of course, which other factors would be there, which other factors uh, uh, we uh, might uh, account uh, for. It's obvious uh, that some of them might uh, uh, be found in the long durée trajectories of these uh, countries. So uh, these countries are countries uh, which have been latecomers to nation stateness, mostly after 1918, uh, some even uh, later. And so they have developed since the 19th century uh, a high degree of uh, aggressive nationalism, uh, which in the beginning was, as always, liberal, but then after the nation, nation state was founded, also uh, developed its uh, conservative, uh, even reactionary to fascist uh, uh, branches. So, uh, and, and many of these nationalisms, not all of them, but many of them have also been kind of populist uh, uh, movements and there is a very, uh, very uh, strong affinity between nationalism and, uh, and, and, and populism in these traditional movements in most of these uh, countries. On the other hand, uh, 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 democracy, liberal democracy, uh, uh, by which I mean embedded democracy, electoral democracy, plus rule of law, plus checks and balances, plus uh, uh, horizontal accountability. These traditions have not so uh, uh, much, have not been so much developed in an institutional sense. There has been more subversive, more libertarian traditions in Poland, for example, but also in, uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia and other, other, uh, other, other places. And of course, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, you look at the situation after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and after the end of the Cold War and after the uh, fall of communism, uh, uh, the alternative, if you had communist dictatorship and you are looking for the, for the other side, uh, you uh, are more likely uh, to go to more rightist uh, uh, alternatives than to democratic socialists or social democrats, at least uh, uh, after the abuse of the term socialist by uh, the communist uh, regimes. Uh, and when economic and social problems uh, motivate you uh, to go from uh, discontent with your government, to disaffection with the democratic system, then of course you are looking for alternatives. And then uh, uh, it's important 
who are what what, what these alternatives are in terms of movements, in terms of political actors on the one hand, and in terms of the institutional order on uh, uh, the other. So uh, the question would be. Uh, uh, is, would, would you say it's more the economic and social uh, problems, it's more the existential fears, which we can find in other places too, also in Great Britain or in Southern Europe, uh, uh, or is it uh, uh, the long durée trajectories and all these traditional uh, uh, factors? And the second point, very short, uh, would we have in these countries you have talked about, would we have to differentiate, as in other parts of the world, also between the old populist syndrome, kind of traditional nationalist populisms or populist nationalisms, and new movements which have developed lately uh, as a product of uh, uh, the political developments around globalization and anti-globalist movements and so on, more short-lived, more sh fashionable, more imitated movements from Trump to Bolsonaro, etc. Uh, would that apply also in Eastern and Central Europe, or would you say it's more of the old vintage? Thank you, and sorry for being so long. Um. Thank you, thank you very much, Hans, for for these uh, uh, deep questions. I, I will try to uh, answer one in uh, English, and uh, maybe I will uh, ask uh, uh, gently Pierre to. Uh, uh, I, I I will uh, try to answer the second one in uh, French, and maybe Pierre, if you could uh, help me to uh, to uh, translate in German. Uh, so. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, so, uh, Hans, the first question was, uh, how can we explain that the, the whole area uh, is shifting? Uh, there is a sort of a, um, uh, similar evolution. We, we can see even uh, in, in, in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, uh, even if uh, the uh, degrees are different. We, uh, we talk much about... Uh, um, Hungary and Poland, but uh, I tried by small examples to, to show that um, this um, uh, um, uh, illiberal shift uh, we can we can see um, um, some parameters also in other uh, countries of the area. And I I I, uh, I would maybe reply by saying that um, what is interesting if we uh, consider the uh, Evolution from a long-term perspective, that uh, we can uh, and from a, on a glo more global level, um, uh, letting uh, letting go the national principles and uh, the ca case studies of Poland or Hungary or uh, Slovakia, etc. We can uh, see that um, uh, in spite of all differences. Um, and specificities of uh, the countries of this area. And in spite of the fact uh, that they do not share uh, any uh, common destiny, they don't share the feeling of belonging to what we call Central and Eastern Europe. It doesn't exist, this feeling uh, of belonging to uh, a sort of area, um, a sort of regional um, belonging is not existing and it didn't work um, when uh, we try to uh, put it in practice. So in spite of all this, there is something in common. Uh, I would say um, that these countries uh, share um, a common destiny in, time of, uh, in times of crisis. And uh, um, some uh, historians such as uh, uh, Ivan Berend, uh, um, a Hungarian-born historian living now in the United States, um, is um, talking about the crisis zone of Europe. And I think this might be uh, one way to uh, reply uh, and to find a, a sort of way out uh, um, of the uh, situation, or at, le or at least to try to uh, um, um, understand what's going on. Because I think that um, the countries of uh, this uh, uh, part of Europe 
share indeed uh, a common destiny in times of crisis. And uh, crisis, I mean the situation where um, um, the um, uh, society is uh, obliged to go to fundamental questions, uh, where the social order is uh, in a sort of um, um, is blocked or uh, uh, and um, we have to come back to what is uh, to essential questions, which is uh, to look back uh, and try to evaluate uh, the road we have taken of the past decades and uh, try also to fix new directions. In this way, the crisis uh, um, means, um, uh, in, in French, I would say, um, le bilan, uh, sort of, um, how we say in English? Bestandaufnahme uh, auf um, uh, Deutsch. <laughs> so to, uh, the, the, um, in this situation, we have to evaluate we, uh, the, uh, the road we have taken. And since this road is, uh, uh, seems to be a dead end to take a new directions. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, crisis, uh, in terms of really questioning about uh, directions to take, um, happened two times in uh, uh, contemporary history of Europe. It was a modernization crisis, which started in the, in the 19th century, where these countries, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russian Empire, uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, realized that they they were uh, lagging behind. They were uh, the late uh, late comers in uh, industrial revolution and tried to uh, find uh, alternative ways to uh, to catch up with the West. And um, it it took uh, uh, almost um, one century, uh, as I said, with this uh, um, uh, agrarian model, fascist model, and the communist model. Uh, to modernize, uh, to to, uh, to catch up with the West, and uh, I think uh, we are uh, experiencing another moment of crisis, which is linked to glo globalization, and uh, um, this um, and the globalization is challenging uh, Western uh, democracies as well, uh, Western Europe uh, uh, and the European Union uh, uh, as a whole is declining, uh, the role of Europe is declining in uh, terms of e economics or uh, political influence in the world. And uh, we are dealing with the same question of uh, aging population and uh, demographic decline. It's maybe less uh, transparent in Western Europe, but it's uh, the questions um, uh, are similar with those in Central and Eastern Europe. And in this way, uh, what's going on in Central Europe um, through this existential crisis linked to globalization today might help us to uh, better um, uh, better um, reflect uh, our own um, challenges. And uh, uh, when it comes to um, your question about uh, uh, the weight of socioeconomic factors, uh, I will try to switch to uh, French because it's uh, more, uh, I, I don't know how to uh, put it in English, I would say that, um, of course, uh, it's not only uh, the socioeconomic factors, and I would even say it's not uh, mainly the economic uh, and social factors. Um, I would say that um, it's, um, uh, and I will switch to French. Um, uh, je, je dirais que uh, um, c'est plus lié uh, à la façon uh, dont um, euh, se sont construites ces sociétés euh, depuis euh, l'époque moderne, où euh, dans les pays euh, occidentaux, on euh, passe avec la euh, double révolution, la révolution industrielle et euh, la démocratisation depuis le, la fin du XVIIIe siècle, si je prends l'Angleterre comme précurseur, euh, sur euh, euh, un modèle de modernité euh, qui, pendant un moment, euh, est hégémonique euh, dans le monde. Euh, en Europe centrale et orientale, euh, les États et les communautés étaient construites euh, autrement. Euh, euh, ces États étaient structurés autour du principe impérial, 
puisque, puisque la, les communautés politiques ne se sont pas construites autour de l'idée de la nation, parce que euh, ces territoires, depuis euh, le Moyen-Âge, étaient euh, euh, extrêmement hétérogènes du point de vue linguistique, religieux, euh, national ou ethnique. Et donc, c'est un autre principe qui a pris le dessus, c'est le principe impérial. Kaiserlich und Königlich, ce, 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 ce principe euh, austro-hongrois qui assurait à la fois l'unité politique de cet espace, mais qui, par la même occasion, empêchait la formation de ce que j'appellerais euh, les communautés politiques modernes, c'est-à-dire le, pou le pouvoir dans ce, dans ce modèle impérial restait concentré entre les mains de l'empereur et euh, d'un cercle extrêmement euh, restreint de, de personnes autour de la cour qui étaient porteurs de, des réformes, porteurs d'une forme de modernité, mais qui, par la même occasion, empêchaient euh, la, comment, comment dire, le partage du pouvoir entre euh, plusieurs groupes sociaux, sociaux euh, notamment auprès de la bourgeoisie, qui euh, n'avait absolument pas le même rôle dans les sociétés centraises européennes que dans les sociétés occidentales. Elle était d'ailleurs ethniquement et, je dirais, étrangère à la nation. C'était des Allemands, c'était des Juifs qui constituaient le cœur des classes moyennes. Et euh, ce principe impérial, ce que je veux dire, c'est que ce principe impérial n'a pas favorisé l'émergence euh, d'une communauté politique forte. Et donc, ce processus de... Euh, vous avez parlé de late commerce. Et je pense que c'est vraiment ça. C'est que... Euh, euh, le, le, le retard que ça a provoqué, a, euh, on a essayé de le combler par, euh, euh, en se tournant vers les modèles alternatifs qui permettraient de construire des communautés politiques fortes. Et que euh, le modèle illibéral, en fait, est juste euh, un acte, une phase dans ce, dans ce processus aujourd'hui. Pierre, uh, and I, 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 I leave you with this. You, 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 you can, uh. Merci, Roman. Kurz äh, zusammengefasst, äh, äh, Roman Krakowski äh, meint äh, für diesen zweiten Teil äh, äh, seiner Antwort, es ist mehr eine äh, Frage, äh, wie äh, diese Gesellschaften sich entwickelt haben, im Besonderen historisch, äh, im Unterschied äh, zum Westen, Teil Europas haben diese Länder keine sogenannte Doppelrevolution gekannt, also eine politische im Sinn französische Revolution plus plus äh, und eine industrielle Revolution gleichzeitig oder konsekutiv. In Zentraleuropa ist die Basis historisch und kulturell äh, und strukturell anders. Zunächst mal imperiales Prinzip versus Nation wegen der Heterogenität äh, dieser Länder. Äh, Punkt zwei, keine moderne politische Gemeinschaft, die in der Lage wäre, autonom eine Reform zu führen. Und Punkt drei, kein Bürgertum in unserem westlichen Sinn, das obendrein ähm, äh, fremd, also das heißt Deutsch war im Sinne von der äh, Elitenschicht. Das heißt, diese äh, äh, gemeinte oder, äh, äh, oder interpretierte Verspätung von sich selbst im Vergleich zu den anderen äh, wurde dann durch alternative Modell kompensiert und äh, eins von diesen alternativen Modell ist eben das illiberale Mo Modell, das Roman Krakowski als eine Phase bezeichnet. Uh, ja, das ist es. Und uh, I would maybe just, uh, I try in English, uh, uh, what, what I try to, uh, to explain that this um, imperial principle uh, in reality um, um, blocked or um, made it more difficult to introduce uh, the representative parliamentary system. Uh, which um, would um, distribute the power between uh, several political actors. And uh, it um, 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 uh, made it more difficult to uh, um, introduce what we call the um, 
the checks and balances or separation of powers um, in, in, in this part of uh, Europe and uh, um, also um, uh, made it difficult um, the development of these counter powers, uh, all this system of checks and balances um, with uh, the, um, the defense of uh, uh, civil liberties. And what, uh, so um, in conclusion, I would say that uh, the personalization of power within the uh, figure of emperor, because we are in, uh, in imperial societies. Uh, in, in fact, um, it um, prevented um, uh, uh, the large parts of societies to um, take their destiny into the, their hands and to, uh, through a representative system, uh, to advocate uh, uh, for their uh, um, interests. And, uh, um, and even to associate themselves according to uh, their uh, private uh, interests. So um, I would say that uh, this uh, personalization of power uh, in one way, um, on, on one hand, uh, ensured uh, the political uh, uh, unity of these territories until the late 19th century. But at the same time, it prevented the formation of political, strong political community and um, I think it's uh, not by chance that, that the uh, authors uh, such as Robert Musil was talking about a man without qualities uh, in interwar period, uh, man without political qualities, without, um, 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 it's uh, for me, uh, uh, what uh, a man without qualities is a man a politic, uh, with, uh, with no politics, a political man. And I think this is the conclusion of the, uh, or it's, uh, it's what, are in, uh, what, uh, um, what is left of imperial societies of this area, which comes back to middle, uh, middle ages of, of modern Europe. And uh, what we, uh, what, um, uh, what um, Sandra was asking about uh, the rule of law um, um, and the, um, um, the, um, um, the principle of uh, uh, conditionality, I think it's a part of this process, how to uh, better uh, distribute power within these societies. Um, thank you, Roman. In <clears throat> consideration of the advanced time of the evening, I propose to read uh, very quick uh, the uh, two last questions the one after the uh, other. Uh, the um, first question uh, is from uh, Alinor Ballanger. Thanks for your very stimulating presentation. Do you know how much the Hungarian and Polish governments are really supported by their people? And if they are not massively supported or if there are significant internal resistance, can we still speak of a populist strategy, or rather use the term demagogy, which does not imply massive support of the people. And the second question is uh, from uh, Matthias Lutzbachmann. Do you think that European social democracies could contribute to a politics which is able to overcome the populist model of politics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I would say that uh, he, uh, when it comes to the uh, support of population to these governments, there are huge differences between the countries in, in Poland and we see it uh, uh, over the last few years and especially uh, uh, the last year in autumn uh, with um, uh, uh, anti-abortion uh, 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 policies and uh, anti-LGBT LGBT policies uh, uh, since 2018-19, uh, um, uh, um, I think something uh, uh, broke in, uh, in Polish society where the people um, put seriously into question the, uh, the law and justice, uh, justice party and the uh, actual government. Um, so uh, uh, while in uh, Hungary, um, the civil society or opposition movements are uh, much uh, weaker um, and uh, uh, 
uh, opposition uh, does, doesn't, um, how to say it, um, they, um, they have uh, huge difficulties to organize themselves and to, um, to propose an alternative, uh, a viable alternative to, uh, to, uh, to Fidesz. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, with this oligarchy uh, um, model, uh, Fidesz, Fidesz party is uh, um, controlling uh, huge uh, uh, parts of uh, economy, uh, especially on local level. And uh, I think this, um, um, and it's very difficult uh, for uh, um, uh, local uh, um, municipalities, for example, to uh, obtain subsi state subsidies and uh, to, uh, uh, to, um, to to uh, to realize their um, um, their policies on the local level. And uh, I think that the, the, these uh, principles of conditionality and the rule of law mechanism when it comes to uh, European subsidies um, that might be uh, given directly to uh, uh, municipalities without uh, going through state agencies uh, would uh, help to, um, to uh, strengthen civil society and uh, um, uh, opposition in Hungary. In Poland, the situation is completely different and uh, I'm quite confident about uh, the capacity of Polish society to uh, to fight, uh, to fight back, and uh, we see it with uh, LGBT uh, teams or uh, uh, abortion uh, laws. Uh, th there is something very, uh, I, I would say, if if you uh, if you have a look on the uh, longer uh, long term perspective, uh, you you can see that in Poland, uh, every um, um, how to say it, uh, uh, um, I, I will try in in French. Uh, ce qu'on peut voir dans, la, dans les combats pour la liberté uh, um, en Pologne, c'est que chaque combat gagné était uh, définitivement gagné. C'est uh, comme un clapé, on ne revenait plus en arrière. Et ça, c'est une grande particularité de la, de la société polonaise. Et on le voit depuis les années uh, uh, 60, alors qu'en uh, Pologne, uh, c'est beaucoup, uh, beaucoup plus complexe. And Pierre, I don't know if you if you can resume just uh, just uh, um, the, uh, the Spezifizität of von, uh, von Polen in under this insicht uh, is that uh, jeder Kampf für die Freiheit in Polen war uh, wenigstens in den uh, Köpfen als definitiv gewonnen, empfunden und uh, angedeutet. Das wäre, sagen wir mal, uh, die uh, polische Spezifizität oder Version uh, uh, dieser, uh, dieser Ansage. Mm. Gut. Uh, merci, Roman. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, if there is not uh, another question or uh, a raised hand, I uh, think uh, we could uh, end uh, this uh, um, uh, paper, conference, discussion, uh, and we apologize uh, uh, for uh, the uh, uh, more time we needed, but it is a very good sign because uh, it, it was a very, very uh, um, um, important discussion, very rich. And uh, Raman, uh, we have to thank you very much uh, for uh, this conference. And uh, uh, we thank also all the participants uh, and uh, the discutants. And um, we will meet the next time uh, in, at the 12th of uh, May for a conference for, from André Freire from the Instituto Universitario de Lisboa, Entwicklungen in Südeuropa. Also wir wechseln dann die Front, höchstwahrscheinlich wieder mal online, aber wir sind jetzt ein gutes Team und das funktioniert. Bleiben Sie gesund. Und Matthias Lutzbachmann, du wolltest noch ein Wort des Schlusses 
sagen, ähm, Roman, merci beaucoup. Et donc, passez une bonne soirée, que ce soit à Paris, à Francfort ou ailleurs, et à très bientôt. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Thank you for all for assisting. Ja, ich will es kurz machen. Vielen herzlichen Dank, Roman Krakowski, für diesen äh, wirklich wichtigen Beitrag, äh, der auch eine Rolle äh, spielt bis tief hinein ähm, in die geografisch anderen Regionen, äh, über die wir heute nicht gesprochen haben, die aber eben zu Europa gehören. Ähm, und äh, Sie haben das ja auch entwickelt, äh, dass hier möglicherweise in Ost-, Mitteleuropa Projekte und Prozesse sich beobachten und identifizieren lassen, die auch für andere gelten und politisch beantwortet werden müssen. Da kommt die Frage nach der sozialdemokratischen Alternative äh, ins Spiel, die wir aber heute nicht mehr diskutieren können. Ähm, und ich würde gerne zum Abschluss, dass Jürgen Thule bitten, vielleicht noch einen Satz zum nächsten Referenten zu sagen. Äh, Ja, uh, <coughs> also from my side, many thanks, Roman Krakowski, for this inspiring uh, talk. Uh, viel habt ihr beiden, Pierre und uh, Matthias, mir ja nicht übrig gelassen für die Ankündigungen für uh, die Zukunft. Wie gesagt, am 12.05. Uh, wird André Frere uh, über Südeuropa sprechen. Ich habe sogar einen genaueren Titel als Pierre hatte. Uh, der Titel ist The Socialist Parties in Iberia Before and After the Great Recession with Some Insights from Greece and Italy. Also man sieht schon, uh, es ist uh, kein einheitliches Südeuropa. Und dann werden wir weiterhin im, einen Monat später, am, am 2. Juni, Uh, Jeffrey Evans uh, from Nuffield aus Oxford haben, der über die Labour Party in uh, United Kingdom sprechen wird und am 16. Juni Johann Ocant von der École des Sociétudes en Social in Paris über Entwicklungen in den skandinavischen Ländern. Und auch von mir herzlichen Dank an alle, auch an die, die mitdiskutiert haben, vor allem an den Referenten, und an den Staff, der programmatisch und technisch dafür gesorgt hat, dass wir hier übergekommen sind und gut miteinander diskutiert haben. Bleiben Sie allesamt gesund.